Yes, sir, good evening. Can we start? Yeah, yeah, surely. Okay. So good. good evening, everyone. We have our own Dr. Rajan Dugal with us. Who doesn't know neuronal pathologist, Dr. Rajan, so, sir, sir, uh, the class is all yours, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kameet. Uh, so today we are going to discuss about uh, kidney biopsy interpretation, and I will focus only on the tubular interstitial compartment pathology. Okay, so before I go to the tubular interstitial compartment, as I've discussed before also in my classes about the glomerular pathology, so today we are going to deal with only the tubular compartment as well as the interstitial compartment. So before we go uh, to the pathology part, let's look at the normal histology. How does it look like? So if we look at this uh, uh, kidney biopsy, uh, there are no glomerulus. What you are see, uh, what you are seeing here are only tubules. You can see, you can appreciate this tubule. Okay, this this tubule has got a big lumen from this area, this place to this place. Okay, similarly, this tubule also has got a big lumen. So I'll show in the PS stain also. This is a hematoxylin and eosin stain. Okay, and hematoxylin and eosin stain. Uh, to comment upon what is the uh, tubular, what is the thickness of the tubular basement membrane, uh, uh, how the brush border looks like. So it is very difficult to uh, comment on these findings on hematoxylin and eosin stain. So all these can be commented on a PS tip. So some pathologies, renal pathologies, they are fond of uh, PAS stain. Some uh, renal pathologies are very fond of silver stain. I'm I'm more fond of PS stain. So you'll see. In my presentation, more PAS stained slabs. Okay, so if you look at these tubules, uh, what you are seeing here is a this is a peritubular capillary uh, with the, with RPC. Similarly, this is a PTC peritubular capillary with the RPC. Okay, now these are the tubules. All these are tubules. Okay, and if you see, they are arranged in a back to back manner. You can see this tubule. You can see this tubule. They are arranged back to back manner. When I say back to back manner, so that means there is no intervening interstitium you can visualize. Okay. So, whenever there is no intervening uh, interstitium you can visualize, that means there is no interstitial edema. Okay. Whenever there is an interstitial edema, that suggests it is, a patho it is a pathology which is going on. Okay. So, here you can appreciate. So, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the proximal as well as the distal tubules when I'll show you the PAS tape. So this is a PS stain where you can appreciate there is a globulus which is there, and these are the tubules. Now in the in the PS stain you can appreciate that this this membrane which is there, okay, this is the tubular basement membrane. You can see this this is a tubular basement membrane. So this is the tubular basement membrane of this tubule. So clearly you can distinguish that this is one tubule, this is another tubule, okay. So there, uh, these tubules are arranged in a back to back manner. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, at this magnification, it will be slightly difficult. But if you look carefully, you can appreciate that there is a thin darker line here in the luminal aspect. Okay. Similarly, you can see these darker lines on this area, darker lines in this area, on the inside portion of the tubules. So all these darker lines are brush water. Now, all these uh, tubules, they have brush water. But look at this tubule, which is there. It is not having any brush border. So the tubule without a brush border is a distal tubule. And the tubule uh, with a brush border, these are proximal tubules. And this is a blood vessel, which is there. Okay. And again, this is a distal tubule because it doesn't have the brush border. So there is one distal tubule which is seen here. There is one distal tubule which is seen here. Okay. Now we go to the higher magnification. So just look at this tubule now. This is a, again a PS chain section. So you can appreciate this is a brush border, okay? So this is a tubule with a, uh, this is the tubular basement membrane, which is there, okay? These blue things, these are tubular nuclei. This, this, uh, this other stuff is uh, cytoplasm. And this is the brush border, inside portion, okay? And this thing is a lumen of the tubule. This is tubular lumen, which is there. Okay, so this is tubular lumen, and inside portion of the tubular lumen is is showing this brush border. So whenever there is disruption of the brush border, that is labeled as tubular injury, and that is the earliest thing what you see in a tubular injury. Some people label it as acute tubular necrosis. Some people, some pathologists label it as acute tubular injury. 
the moment we say acute tubular necrosis, that, that it appears that there is necrosis of the tubular epithelial cells. But normally in a tubular injury, it is only a mild tubular injury will produce only a loss of the brush ball. Okay. And there will be no necrosis of the tubules or tubular epithelial cells. Necrosis of the tubular epithelial cells occur mostly in a moderate kind of acute tubular injury or very severe kind of acute tubular injury. And sometimes the tubular injury is so severe that it will produce only, uh, there will be complete loss of nuclear details. You will not see any nuclear. So that is that we label it as cortical necrosis. So if you compare these tubules, which are here with a big lumen, this tubule, they have got a brush border, but this tubule, it doesn't have a brush border. Okay, so this tubule without a brush border, this is a distal tubule. This is a distal tubule, and all these with a the brush border, these are proximal tubules. And this is a blood vessel. We will not discuss about the blood vessel today. Again, a PS chain which highlights that the these tubules are arranged in a back-to-back -back manner. So there is no so you can see this tubule which is there. You can see this tubule which is there. So there is hardly any interstitial in between. Okay, so that, that suggests that there is no interstitial edema and these tubules are in a back-to-back -back manner. So most likely there is no definite evidence of any tubular injury. This is H and E stain and H and E stain, hematoxylin and eosin stain, which shows that some of the tubules, they appear separated from each other. Okay, and they are separated and there is a pale kind of pale pink kind of thing which is there. So this pale pink material that this is called as interstitial edema. You can see the separation of the tubules here. So there is interstitial edema which is there and presence of interstitial edema uh, suggests that there is possibly there is evidence of some tubular injury also. So look at this tubular nuclei. You can see this blue color stuff. These are tubular nuclei, tubular nuclei which are there, tubular nuclei which are there, tubular nuclei which are there. So they should be and uh, they should be seen at regular intervals, just like this. One nucleus here, one nucleus here, one nucleus here. But here what is happening is you can see one nucleus here, one nucleus here. But in this area, you don't see any nucleus. So that suggests there is some amount of tubular injury which is going on. A high magnification shows that you can see that there is a brush border which is there. And there is disruption of the brush border and this brush border is getting disrupted and it is seen within the tubular lumen also. So that suggests that there is some amount of tubular injury which is going on, but there is no interstitial infiltrate. And this is the PS chain which highlights that, look at this uh, tubule and you can appreciate these tubular nuclei which are there, one, two. And in this area, you don't see any tubular nuclei. Like in this, this area to this area, you don't see any tubular nuclei. There is one pale looking nucleus, nucleus here, one pale looking nucleus here, but otherwise, like in this area, the complete there is loss of tubular. The other thing is, uh, you can appreciate the disruption of the brush border also at places. You can see there is the brush border is here, and suddenly there is some disruption of the brush border which is seen here. And similarly, you can see the continuity of the brush border is broken in this area. So all these findings suggest that there is tubular injury. Similarly, you can see you can see the continuity of the brush border in this area, and suddenly in this area again it is continuous. But in this this focus, there is loss of brush border. So that suggests that there is evidence of tubular injury. Uh, now if you look at these tubules, so again uh, this is a PS chain, and it highlights. Similarly, the brush border is seen here, and in this area, there is hardly any brush border which is visualized. So that suggests that there is a tubular injury. Uh, but if you look at these tubules, the tubules are arranged in a back-to-back -back manner. There is no interstitial edema. Okay. So that suggests it is a very mild kind of tubular injury. As the tubular injury progresses, uh, you you are going to see interstitial edema. You are going to see more disruption of the brush border. You are going to see loss of tubular nuclei. So uh, we should know that uh, there are certain basic stains which we use in kidney biopsies. Hematoxin and eosin stain is a very good stain to interpret what kind of interstitial infiltrate is there, whether it is composed of lymphocytes, plasma cells, eosinophils, neutrophils. It is a good stain to pick up that. And Mason and PS stain is a good stain to uh, comment on the globular morphology, to comment on the uh, tubular morphology, uh, uh, whether the, uh, how the tubular basement membrane looks like, how is the brush border, okay? 
And Mason's trichrome stain is a good stain to interpret fibrosis. So you have to remember one important thing that this is cortex and this area is medulla. So whenever we see Mason's trichrome stain, you have to interpret in the cortical area. You don't have to interpret in the, so you have to interpret in this area that is the cortex. Because if you see uh, in the medulla, you see a lot of bluish color. So that doesn't mean there is interstitial fibrosis. So normally the medullary tubules are separated from each other as compared to the cortex. So you will see some bluish areas. That doesn't mean there is fibrosis. So whatever, whenever we interpret fibrosis, it has to be interpreted in the renal cortex because Mason's trichrome stain, which is there for assessment of fibrosis, normally also renal medulla will show some interstitial fibrosis or interstitial edema kind of thing in the renal medulla. So whenever we have to interpret about the interstitial fibrosis to play trophy, we always comment on the renal cortex. That's why in our kidney biopsies also, whenever we look at a kidney biopsy, if there is only 30% cortex and 70% medulla, we will say it is a scanty renal cortex. It shows five glomuli, one is globally stereos. Now we interpret our, uh, whether there is tubular trophy interstitial fibrosis in that 30% renal cortex. And we will ignore that 70% renal medulla. So though there are certain pathologies which occurs in renal medulla, for example, ascending infections, like pyelonephritis, it will start from the pelvic, renal pelvic area. So that, may, uh, that means pelvic aortic junction, it will start. So whenever the ascending infections are there or urinary infections are there, you'll see pathology more in the renal medulla than in the renal cortex. In a transplant biopsy is also BKV nephropathy. If there is no uh, renal medulla which is seen in the biopsy, there is a possibility you can miss BKV nephropathy. So renal medulla should be there. Uh, whenever in a, in, a, in a transplant biopsy, there should be some portion of the renal medulla which should be represented in the biopsy uh, tissue because many times the early BKV nephropathy changes will be seen only in the renal medulla. Similarly, acute pyelonephritis early changes can be seen only in the renal medulla. But you have to remember that when you are interpreting the Mason's trichrome stain, never interpret in the renal medulla. This is just for comparison. You can see the renal medulla which appears very bluish and look at the renal cortex. We are uh, saying this is renal cortex because we are seeing these glomuli which are there. Because wherever glomuli are there, that is a renal cortex. And you can see some amount of interstitial fibrosis also which is seen there. So that suggests that there is some chronicity in the renal cortex, but we have to ignore interpretation of uh, fibrosis in the renal bed. This just to highlight, this is a normal kind of finding uh, in Mason's trichrome stain. If you, this is a vessel, so around surrounding the vessel, there will be some amount of interstitial fibrosis. So whenever we comment on interstitial fibrosis, we ignore minimal amount of fibrosis, which is seen around the vessels. We will not quantify this fibrosis. This is like a normal finding. As you can see here, there is some bluish areas which are seen here. So that suggests there is some chronicity which is there. Now, just compare this area, this blue color with this blue color. Now, this blue color appears slightly light blue as compared to the dark blue color what you see here. So the light blue color means there is interstitial edema, but the dark blue color means that there is interstitial fibrosis. So... Whenever we say this is acute or this is chronic, so acute, the definition is there is acute tubular necrosis. So acute tubular necrosis, so in the tubular necrosis compartment, so whenever we label things as acute or chronic, so I'll mention the acute thing is whenever there is acute tubular injury or acute tubular necrosis. So you can find ATN. Along with that, you may find some interstitial edema. When we say there is acute tubular interstitial nephritis, so that means acute tubular interstitial nephritis means that there is ATN. Along with that, there is interstitial edema, but there is also interstitial infiltrate. So ATN with edema with interstitial infiltrate, that is labeled as ATIN. Now, when we say acute interstitial nephritis, that means there is no ATN as such. There is only interstitial edema. And in that area of interstitial edema or interstitial uh, uh, in, in, in that area of uh, in that area where the tubules are separated from each other, so that means there is interstitial expansion. And that expansion is showing more edematous kind of changes. And if you find inflammation in those edematous areas, that becomes acute interstitial nephritis. So we have to remember that whenever we look at the immunofluorescence also, we, we, uh, we know that 
normally normally uh, these are the tubules so normally the tubular cast are always iga positive so when my iga is seen in the tubular cast that means these tubular cast are composed of tam phosphate protein and that means that is a normal fine so uh, when i when i uh, how do i know that my iga stain is working when i look at tubules and those tubular cast are positive for iga i know my iga is working so uh, so that is a normal finding so tam phosphate protein cast they are most they are always iga positive okay when you see cast like in this case the iga is not taking up the stain in the tubular cast so iga is negative in the tubular cast that means that either my stain is not working which was not the case in this uh, in this biopsy but the, that means this cast are not made up of tan phosphate protein. So that means either these casts are made up of something, some else thing. And the most common uh, exogenous material which can produce, which can uh, make up the tubular cast is like So whenever uh, we see in immunoprocess, IGA is not seen in the tubular cast. And on morphology, I've seen that there are some tubular casts which are seen and which appear fractured also, which are showing some epithelial cell, tubular epithelial cell reaction. I'll show uh, one case of cast nephropathy also. Uh, now, look at this. This is kappa. So, kappa is staining the tubular cast. It is 3 plus staining and lambda is negative in these tubular casts. Okay. So, that means uh, negative lambda and 3 plus kappa means that there is a kappa light chain restriction. So, this case is uh, a case of cast nephropathy with the kappa light chain restriction. So, just looking at the IgA, we know that Possibly the cast are made up of something, exo some exogenous material. This exogenous material, as I have told you, most commonly are light chain, but sometimes even myoglobin can produce cast which will not stain with IG. Uh, so, when do we call anything as a acute tubular interstitial nephritis? As I have told you, when you see these tubules, they are showing tubular injury. There is separation of the tubules from each other, that means there is interstitial edema. And in those areas of interstitial edema, you see a lot of bluish color cells. You see a lot of cells here. Okay. High magnification shows that these are some of these cells have got, they are bilo and they have got uh, orange color cytoplasm. You can see this cell. It has got two nucleus. One nucleus is this one and one small nucleus is this one. So there are bilo cells. Here you also you can see bilo to trilo cells. So uh, so, lobation of the hair also you can see one nucleus here, one nucleus here. They have got orange color cytoplasm. So, that suggests that these are eosinophils. So, when you see a lot of eosinophils in a, in, a, in, a, in a kidney biopsy with interstitial edema, uh, you know that we are dealing with acute interstitial nephritis. Now, if there is ATN also, then you label that as acute to interstitial nephritis. Okay? And whenever we see eosinophils, possibly we say that it could be drug uh, associated. So, so when do we call uh, uh, biopsies as chronic? So opposite to acute thing. That means instead of tubular injury or tubular necrosis, you see tubular atrophy. And in, instead of interstitial edema, you see interstitial fibrosis. Okay. So when there is a, a tubular atrophy, whenever there is a, a chronic tubular interstitial nephritis, that means when, when, when I say chronic tubular interstitial nephritis, that means there is chronicity in the tubules and there is chronicity in the interstitial. And in that areas of, so chronicity in the tubules means there will be evidence of tubular atrophy. Chronicity in the interstitial means there will be interstitial fibrosis instead of interstitial edema. And if you find inflammation in the areas of interstitial fibrosis or in areas of scarring, that is labeled as chronic tubular interstitial nephritis. Okay. So, presence of uh, tubular trophy with interstitial fibrosis plus interstitial inflammation in the areas of scarring or in the areas of interstitial fibrosis, that is labeled as chronic tubular interstitial nephritis. For example, in this biopsy, what you are seeing here is, you can, you can appreciate these glomeri. There is a bonus capsule, but there is uh, there is expansion of the urinary space. So, this is a urinary space. Uh, between the capillary loop and the bonus capsule is called as a urinary space. So, there is expansion of the urinary space. So this is called as a globulocystic kind of a change. Now what you see is, uh, there is a lot of pink kind of thing in the interstitium, and there are a lot of blue looking cells. Now this is better appreciated on a PS chain where you see that majority of these tubules, they are smaller in size as compared to these larger tubules. These larger tubules suggest 
that the, there is a compensatory enlargement of these tissues, and majority of the other tissues they are smaller in diameter, they are smaller in size. So all these smaller looking tissues, these are areas of tubular atrophy. A higher magnification of the same, you can see that this is the normal looking tissue which is dilated, and look at these tissues, and look at the lumen also. So this tissue has got a lumen, a central space, but this tissue has no lumen. This tissue has no lumen. This tubule has very narrow kind of lumen. Okay, so all these are, uh, all these are atrophic tubules. And even in the interstitium, you can see there is a lot of pink kind of stuff. Uh, there is separation of the tubules from each other. That suggests that there is interstitial expansion. And if you see dark pink uh, or darker color areas in the interstitium, that suggests there is interstitial fibrosis, which can be further confirmed when we do Mason's trichrome step. So a uh, high magnification of one more atrophic tubule, you can just compare the uh, thickness of the tubular basin rampant in this tubule, in this atrophic appearing tubule, with this tubule, a non-atrophic tubule. So you can see this non-atrophic tubule is showing a thin tubular basin rampant, and it has got a big lumen also, okay? And the, non and the atrophic tubules, look at this tubule, it has got no lumen, this tubule, hardly any lumen, this tubule, hardly any lumen, and there is wrinkling of the, this tubule, no lumen, so there is wrinkling of the tubular basin ramblin, so these are areas of tubular atrophy, and this is a mason trichrome stain which highlights that there are a lot of bluish area in the intersection that suggests there is evidence of intersection fibrosis. A high magnification of the same, you can appreciate, even on a mason trichrome stain, you can see this tubular basin ramblin which is thin, and you can compare it with this tubular basin ramblin, which is very thick. Okay, similarly, you can compare with this tubular basin rampant, which is very thick from this area to this area, as compared to the normal looking tubular basin rampant, which can be appreciated. Now, there are different patterns of tubular atrophy also, how the atrophic tubules looks like. Now, if the atrophic tubules, they show a central uh, dam hospital protein, which is smaller kind of globule, which is seen in the tubular lumen, they look like thyroid follicles, that is called as thyroidization of the tubules. If you see ischemic wrinkling of the tubular basement rampant, as you see here, okay, this is a classical pattern of tubular trophy where there is ischemic wrinkling of the tubular basement rampant with narrowing of the lumen. Now, this pattern of tubular trophy where you find thyroid like uh, colloid follicle, uh, colloid like material within the uh, tubule, tubular lumen, that is called as thyroidization pattern of tubular trophy. And there are some tubules where you see these tubules, there is a thyroidization pattern. In, in addition to that, the tubular epithelial cells show nuclei along with perinuclear halo. This is a morphology you get to see in uh, endocrinization pattern of tubular trophy. So there are three patterns of tubular trophy. First is there is wrinkling of the tubular basement membrane. The second is where you see thyroidization of the tubules. And the third is where you see uh, uh, halo appearance around the tubular nucleus. So this pattern is called as thyroidization pattern of tubules because they look like thyroid follicle. This is how a thyroid will look like. So this is called as thyroidization pattern of tubular trophy. Sometimes on a PS stain, you see these kind of broad kind of tubular casts. So these are called as broad highland casts. And whenever you see broad tub highland tubular casts, that means uh, it, we are possibly dealing with a chronic kidney disease. Similarly, you can see these broad kind of island cars and they are PAS positive, okay? That is very important because if they are PS negative and, and there is a reaction of the tubular epithelial cells to this uh, to, to the cast material, then you start suspecting that possibly we are dealing with some something abnormal. That means these casts are not made up of cam phosphoprotein. These casts are made up of some exogenous material. And majority of the tubular interstitial diseases will produce some glomerular changes also. As you can see here, there is expansion of the urinary space. So this is called as a glomerular cystic glomerulus. And this is like, this is a classic appearance of a chemically wrinkled glomerulus where you find a glomerular cystic change. So whenever there are tubular interstitial pathologies, they are, they are going to secondarily affect the glomerular compartment also. And even the vessels will show uh, thick, uh, vessels walls hypertensive kind of changes you can see there so if in a kidney biopsy you you see thick walled vessels that means these vessels are pathological that means this patient is most likely hypertensive and looking at this biopsy this is a mason trichrome stain 
this is a mason stack on stain and you can see that there is a lot of bluish stuff you can see a globally sclerosis globus here a globally sclerosis globule kind of structure so that means this is a globus this is a non sclerosis globus but look at this look at this so there is periglobular fibrosis lot of bluish stuff in the interstitial that means there is lot of interstitial fibrosis and there there are blue uh, there are these dark looking cells also so a presence of these kind of lipoid aggregates in the in the scarred renal cortex suggests that there is said that this is possibly a chronic fibrinization of fibers. So uh, it will be more of a case-based kind of a thing. I'll discuss four or five cases. Uh, 26, seven year male, dialysis dependent AKA secondary to acute gastroenteritis. Urine routine microscopy show three plus proteins, creatinine is 11, very ATN, very AIL. So when, you, when we look at this biopsy, this is a PS stain. So in the globular compartment, you can see some tubules, which are showing this, uh, these tubular casts, which, and these tubules are big, they have, and they are filled with these kind of cast material, which is there. And look at these glomeri also. I'll show high magnification of the globulus. This is high magnification of the globulus. And this is a PS change. You can see a positive Bowman's capsule, PH positive Bowman's capsule. But this material, which is expanding the interstitial, this is PAS negative. Okay. Similar kind of material is also seen in the tubules. Uh, this material is showing, uh, this is a congruous stain and this material is positive with congruent. So that means it is congophilic material. And whenever congruent is positive, uh, but this material is negative with congruent, that means the tubular material is not amyloid. But the material which is deposited in the globuli, that is surely amyloid because it is showing congophilia. Because it is uh, positive with congruent stain. Now, uh, we have to demonstrate apple green bright pinches to say that surely it is amyloid. And this material uh, also showed apple green bright when we look at couple and a couple and is showing no restriction in the globuli as well as in the tubular cast. So these tubular casts both are showing equal kind of staining. So it is not like uh, one case which I showed you before where kappa was 3 plus and lambda was negative. Even the protein absorption droplets, they were staying with both kappa lambda. That means no restriction. Uh, we did serum amyloid associated protein and serum amyloid associated protein is positive. That suggests we are dealing with secondary amyloidosis. Now, the problem is, we read the history, the serum pattern was 11. So, presence of amyloid, we are not able to explain the tubular dysphagia pathology. We can explain the 3 plus protein urea this patient has. Now, when we look at the tubular dysphagia compartment, these tubule, this tubule is separated from this tubule. There is a distance here. So, that means there is interstitial expansion with presence of these blue looking cells. That means there is evidence of interstitial edema with interstitial inflammation. As we move to high magnification, we see the infiltrate is showing some of these, some of these orange color cells, cytoplasm, uh, cells with orange color cytoplasm. So these are eosinophils. And there are some lymphocytes also interspersed, which can be seen. So eosinophils again. So uh, there is secondary amyloidosis, but the uh, tubular interstitial pathology that will explain the rise in serum pattern because in this patient, the serum pattern was around 11. So sometimes two pathologies can coexist. So in this case, there was amyloid. And along with that, there was acute tubular interstitial nephritis. So we come to case number two. This is a 46 year male with a progressively rise in serum pattern. Alopecia totalis, history of weight loss. Uh, ANA was 1 to 320. So possibility was very chronic, very acute interstitial nephritis. When we look at this biopsy, you can see these glomeri which are there, but there are a lot of blue cells which are there in the interstitial. So presence of a lot of blue cells in the interstitial suggests that there is a lot of interstitial inflammation. As you move to high uh, a medium power view, you see that these uh, there is a lot of infiltrate. Uh, the tubules are separated from each other. Okay, and there is a lot of infiltrate which is there in between these, uh, in in these areas of interstitial expansion. Similarly. Just see here, this tubule is separated from this tubule. So there is interstitial expansion. As we look at the uh, nature of infiltrate, which is expanding the interstitial, we, we see there are a lot of plasma cells. So these are the plasma cells, and these dark color cells are lymphocytes. And few scattered eosinophils are also seen. 
के सो द मूवमेंट वी सी लॉट ऑफ प्लाज्मा सेल्स इन द एरियाज ऑफ इंटरसीशन एक्सपेंशन we suspect that uh, this, uh, the presence of uh, increase number of plasma cells doesn't mean it uh, we are dealing with a multiple myeloma so presence of plasma cells in a in this kind of setting where there is interstitial expansion interstitial inflammation and inflammation is rich in plasma cells and if there is background edema that means no significant chronic chronicity then we suspect it is a atn with prominence of plasma cells atn with prominence of plasma cells is commonly seen in autoimmune pathologies autoimmune diseases it can be seen in igg4 related tuberculosis disease and arthritis and even in some infection related tuberculosis disease and arthritis you can see prominence of plasma cells for example uh, as uh, during covid times uh, uh, when there was infections and there was renal dysfunction a biopsy showed evidence of atn with prominence of plasma cells and possibly they were related to covid even post vaccination sometimes occasional biopsies were seen With renal dysfunction, and they show they also show uh, AT angle prominence of plasma cells. Uh, now, but in addition to all those findings, there was an occasional giant cell also, which was seen in these areas of interstitial expansion. So, presence of giant cell is unusual finding for uh, autoimmune tuberculosis infection of arthritis or for uh, IgG4 related disease. Uh, but there was no granuloma as such. Now, as we uh, uh, took more serious sections, there was one area which showed presence of granuloma. Also. So, presence of granuloma with plasma cells and giant cells is a possibility that we are dealing with a granulomatous tuberculosis infection arthritis. And the most common cause for granulomatous tuberculosis infection arthritis are drugs. Okay, the second most common is mostly sarcoidosis. Okay, uh, we don't uh, though infections remain as one of the close differential whenever. In in our setting, in Indian setting, you see granuloma in in a kidney biopsy or in lymph node biopsy. Your first differential is always tuberculosis. You always consider that. But these granulomas are non-necrotizing granulomas. They were not showing any KZS necrosis. When we did IgG stain, IgG stain showed some kind of a minimal staining along the tubular base membrane. This can be due to plasma cells also taking up the IgG four, uh, taking up the IgG stain. So it is just a non-specific finding. So the, uh, it is granulomatous tuberculosis infection arthritis. This patient also had metastatic necrosis, and when the FNAC was done, EUS guided FNAC was done from the metastatic necrosis. It showed non-necrotizing epithelial cell granuloma. So this was a case of sarcoidosis with the involvement of the uh, kidney. We come to the next case. Fifty-six year male patient was under evaluation for a pancreatic heart lesion. Uh, and PET scan shows mildly enhancing metabolic active uh, mass, which is seen in the head of pancreas with proximal CPT dilatation. Other metabolic active muscles were also seen in morning density and process neck body of pancreas. There was increased fat, stra fat standing surrounding fat standing, which was seen, and metabolic active lymph nodes, uh, left and right iliac, as well as inguinal lymph nodes. So, uh, with this kind of clinical picture, the first thing which comes to your mind is whether I'm dealing with a Adenocarcinoma, or whether uh, since they are metabolic active lymph nodes, or whether it is a lymphomatous cause. Uh, so this patient went to a GI surgery department. Hemoglobin was fine. Even the tumor markers were within range. The only uh, so if you look at the serum creatinine, so this this patient went to a GI surgeon. So uh, he just ignored the serum creatinine of one point eight five. It was towards the higher side. But uh, he also thought that it may turn out to be something else. So they did a pancreatic biopsy. Pancreatic biopsy, normally, you don't, you don't get to see pancreatic mass biopsies. Uh, majority of these patients, uh, they will undergo Whipple's operation and all that. Uh, but pancreatic biopsy was done and it was reported as fibrotic tissue immunity, inadequate for opinion. And as you know, pathologists, they love this word, correlate clinically. So it was reported as fibrotic tissue immunity and correlate clinically. And the GI surgeon also, he correlated everything clinically and empirically, he started this patient on steroid, uh, 20 milligram per day, oral steroids. Now, uh, he presented to a nephrology, uh, to the nephrology department with rising serum, serum cutting for 1.85 to 6.2. Urine routine microscopy showed trace proteins, RBC is 5 to 6, ultrasonography showed bilateral bulky kidneys, and CAS, as we know, and CAS are always awaited. Uh, clinical diagnosis was RBI. Now, uh, the kidney biopsy was done, which is, uh, you see a lot of pink stuff and blue areas. 
So whenever so whenever you see pink with blue areas, you know that possibly there is fibrosis and there is inflammation. So I'll just rush through these uh, these slides. So there was evidence of these kind of bluish areas. These were the areas of inter uh, interstitial inflammation, and this pink stuff. These all are areas of fibrosis. This is a pH chain which shows that these tubules are separated from each other. There is interstitial expansion with fibrosis, uh, with fibrosis and interstitial filtrate. Now we'll look at the, uh, this is a Mason's trichrome strain, which is, so uh, this was a case which I reported in Madanta and uh, that time we were doing Mason's trichrome strain, which was more, which, in which uh, the counter strain is green in color, malachite green. That is why you uh, interface as green. The previous, uh, the previous images which I've shown you, they are all like fibrosis is appearing as blue color. So you remember that fibrosis will appear dark blue and edema will appear as light blue or sky blue. So when we look at this uh, uh, infiltrate, this infiltrate shows eccentrically placed nucleus with this kind of cytoplasm. Now you can see the eccentrically placed nucleus and the cytoplasm. So all these are plasma cells. There are sheets of plasma cells and this is a vein. So surrounding the vein also, the infiltrate is also extending into the vascular wall or venous wall. So inflammation of the veins is called as phlebitis. So as you can see here, this is a vein. And this inflammation is also extending on the, into the veins that suggests there is phlebitis. So, so it is a it is a lesion which is showing uh, uh, it is a uh, the kidney biopsy showing dominantly fibrosis. And in that in those areas of fibrosis, you are seeing a lot of plasma cells. There are no granulomas, and there is evidence of phlebitis also. Uh, the inflammation is also extending into the veins. There were some areas which were showing less inflammation but more of fibrosis. All these elongated nuclei, these are fibroblastic cells. Okay. So that suggests there, there were some areas which were more dense fibrosis. Uh, IgG stain shows that there is very minimal kind of granular staining along the tubular basement membrane. When you see granular staining along the tubular basement membrane with IgG, that suggests a possibility of the uh, autoimmune kind of tubular transition of fibrosis. Commonly seen with lupus, connective tissue disorder, you see this kind of a granular staining. Uh, along the tubular basement membrane. Similar staining can also be seen in autoimmune tubular transition arthritis as well as in IgG for local tubular transition arthritis. So I'll just show you this. So we did IgG stain and IgG stain highlight all these plasma cells. They are pairing as brown color, but a significant number of these IgG positive plasma cells, they were taking up the IgG four stain also. So this is IgG four stain, which shows that more than 30% Ig uh, more than thirty percent plasma cells, which are Ig taking up the IgG chain, which are IgG positive plasma cells. Actually, more than thirty percent of these IgG positive plasma cells are IgG four subclass positive also. So that suggests that we are dealing with the IgG four related pigment resistance hepatitis. We got the serum uh, immunoglobulin levels done, serum IgG four levels, and they were towards a higher side. This patient was managed with sixty milligram. Per day for four to five weeks, taper down the next three to four months. The present keratin during that time, this is the old case, was 0.8. But I still remember the pancreatic lesion also reduced in size. So, most likely, it was an autoimmune pancreatitis with a lot of fibrosis, uh, which was reported initially as fibrotic tissue only. But there was no inflammation in that uh, pancreatic biopsy. Uh, obviously, that could be a sampling uh, issues also, sampling uh, error also. Uh, now, uh, now, uh, whenever when this patient the steroids were tapered down, and the creatin again started rising, so that is a problem with IgG four uh, disease. We really don't know how long to give steroids, and the moment we start tapering down steroids, either the creatin starts rising or the in this case the pancreatic tissue also the pancreatic lesion also started increasing its size. So there are some cases. This is not related to uh, the previous case. This is another case, and this uh, this patient also elderly patient. Who presented with the uh, who was dialysis dependent uh, for the last uh, few months, and but there was uh, polyclonal hypogamma globulinemia because of that polyclonal hypogamma globulinemia and normal kidney size, the biopsy was performed, thinking that possibly we are uh, I uh, possibly thinking that we should not be missing out on any myeloma, uh, though it was polyclonal, but then also because of polyclonal hypogamma globulinemia, the biopsy was done. Majority of the glomeruli, as you can appreciate here, this is a PS10. Majority of the glomeruli are sclerosed. 
there, there is there is infiltrate in the areas of interstitial fibrosis, and this infiltrate is predominantly composed of plasma cells. Lot of plasma cells here. Uh, but this biopsy looks more chronic as compared to the previous biopsy because majority of the glomerular cells and all these are plasma cells. And when you look at the IG, IgG stain, the IgG stain is staining all these fibrotic areas. Kappa lambda is also showing similar pattern of staining with uh, similar pattern of staining. That means there is no restriction. And kappa lambda and uh, IgG4 shows increased number of IgG4 positive plasma cells. And sometimes the IgG4 disease can present with a mass-like lesion. So this was a case, a nephrectomy specimen which showed a mass-like lesion. And this was an IgG4 disease. And there was bone formation and osteoid formation with a lot of calcification. So, some, uh, so there are three phases of IgG4 disease. There is a cellular phase, there is a fibrocellular phase, and then there is a fibrotic phase. And when they present in a fibrotic phase, then there is no role of immunosuppressive therapy, no role of steroid. But when they are in a cellular and fibrocellular phase, there is role of uh, in, uh, there is role of steroids because the moment they enter into a fibrotic stage, they can produce a tumor-like lesion, okay, and they are called as inflammatory pseudo tumors. And uh, when uh, they present with the tumor-like uh, stage or fibrotic stage uh, or a tumor uh, or a pseudo tumor kind of a, in a in a pseudo, pseudo tumor kind of a setting, you need to uh, do remove these tumors. Because these tumors will release interferons and interleukins, and uh, these interferons and interleukins, uh, they will cause constitutional symptoms. And the moment you remove the uh, this tumor, the all the constitutional symptoms are gone because the uh, the secretions, uh, these tumors which are secreting these interleukins and cytokines, they are out of body now. So you will uh, the patient will be symptomatically better. And uh, the problem is if the uh, if this disease is affecting one kidney. Since the disease is there, so you need to give immunosuppressive therapy to these patients even after removing the tumor because this can affect the other kidneys. So uh, IgG4 related disease is a distinct clinical entity with various patterns of organ involvement and no single serologic or other test exists to diagnose this disease definitely. And it is a combination of histology, immunophenotype. When I say immunophenotype, you can say immunostochemistic, clinical and histological and lab features which make the diagnosis. So this was a transplant biopsy, uh, and uh, a period of three months, there was rise in serum creatinine. So uh, when we look at the transplant biopsy and you see some blue cells, you you feel that it, we are dealing with possibly rejection. But the interesting part was, look at the PS chain, and uh, there were casts which were bearing atypical. And there was a reaction of tubular epithelial cell to this cast over That is very important. Whenever the tubular epithelial cells, uh, see, our defense system will react to any exogenous material. So uh, this was like a response of the tubular epithelial cells to uh, this cast material. So that suggests that this cast material is composed of some exogenous kind of a substance. It is not a TAM phosphor protein. Because had it been a TAM phosphor protein, you will not see this kind of a tubular epithelial cell reaction or neutrophilic reaction. This neutrophilic reaction or tubular epithelial cell reaction to the cast material suggests that the casts are composed of some exogenous material. And these casts were also showing fractures. There were cracks which were there. And the tubular epithelial cells, they were trying to eat up this cast protein. And when we did kappa lambda, lambda was like 3 plus positive and kappa was negative. And even if you see the tubular basement membrane, it is staining with lambda, but there is no staining with kappa. So that means there is an early light chain deposition disease also. So there is a, a cast nephropathy, lambda restricted, and along with that, there is early light chain deposition disease. Another image shows that the, all the tubular basement membrane is staining with lambda, but here it is negative with kappa. So it is cast nephropathy, lambda restricted with early light chain deposition disease. So uh, this is more of the vascular compartment. So I think uh, I'm done with the tubular interstitial things I showed you around four or five cases where uh, how these uh, uh, tubular pathologies, interstitial uh, diseases will look like. Uh, from your exam point of view, cast nephropathy will be important because they, uh, in the exam, they, uh, there is a possibility they might show you uh, an image like this where the cast are there and there is a reaction and they will show immunofluorescence image. 
which shows that lambda either kappa is shining and lambda is negative or lambda is shining and kappa is uh, kappa is 3 plus and lambda is negative or lambda is 3 plus and kappa is negative. So that suggests light change restriction. So it is important that you should be aware about these, aware about, uh, you are aware about these equivalent uh, restriction technologies. So this was my last slide. I don't want to show you the, uh, this is about vascular pathologies. So that maybe next time I'll discuss about vascular pathology. So this class was only about the tubulantization part. So if there are any uh, queries or if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Hello, Puni? Yes, sir. I think students uh, sir, can ask or put in chat box, whatever way they are comfortable. Yeah. Any queries? Yeah. If you have. Either they have under understood everything. Yes, sir. So, no queries, it seems. Are, are there any queries? So no queries? Okay. If there are no queries, uh, we can thank sir for again giving us our time. So there is one, sir. Oh, there is one. What else important from the IR? This is what they, this, uh, this uh, Dr. Anurag must be exam going. Okay. So what else is important from exam point of view? So uh, uh, see, the thing is, uh, the important thing is amyloid. I showed you one case, first case, where uh, the glomerulus is there and you see this PA stain where the exogenous material is deposited. So amyloid is important from exam point of view. They might show you a case of uh, membranous, uh, uh, a glomerulus with membrane thickening and they will show you IgG stain and they, they might ask you what is the thing, uh, what is there. Uh, that is a membranous. The other thing is, um, they might show you a glomerulus where there is fibrin thrombi within the glomerular capillary loops, and that is thrombotic microangiopathy. There could be C4D uh, uh, positive, which can be shown as I imagine that what is this stain? So that is a, a positive C4D stain. They might show you, I, I've shown you Mason's typhoon. So they might show you image saying, what, what stain is this? It may appear blue, it may appear green. So you have to say that it is a Mason Chapman stain. They might show you PAS stain where, where they will ask you what, what stain it is. So you know that this is a PS stain because it is showing that kind of image and dark color and all that stuff. So from exam point of view, I think membranous, amyloid, uh, tubular cast, cast nephropathy, uh, these three crescents. So in crescents, they might show you uh, uh, a crescent and they will, uh, they will, uh, uh, okay, well, immunofluorescence image where there will be linear IgG staining. So that suggests that uh, possibly this crescent is related to anti gpm disease. So I think these are the important. I don't think anyone will show you electron microscopy. But uh, in electron microscopy, if somebody shows you something, it possibly uh, there may be there may be diffuse photocytic foot processing uh, which can be seen. Uh, specific biopsy findings in T cell rejection to look for. Uh, it is T cell rejection only PCR. Sir, how to differentiate BKV nephropathy with T cell mediated rejection? So, so it is not a transplant class, but I'll answer this. So, uh, trans, uh, so BKV nephropathy and T cell mediated rejection will look very similar because uh, even in a BKV nephropathy, per se can produce can uh, can give tubulitis. There could be tubulitis. There could be uh, there will be interstitial infiltrate. But you have to remember, if in the interstitial infiltrate, you see some prominence of plasma cells and there is some minimal amount of interstitial fibrosis, think of BKV nephropathy as a first possibility rather than t cell mediated rejection. Many times when I look at a biopsy, there is an urgent biopsy which is done. Uh, and mostly BKV nephropathy, you get to see two to three months post-transplant. You will not see in the first one. Uh, so if you see interstitial infiltrate, if you see prominence of plasma cells, or some scattered plasma cells with interstitial fibrosis. Uh, and there are some tubular nuclei which are large, which are showing cytopagallic changes. It is more towards the BKV nephropathy. And obviously, you have to do SP40 stain. 
you have to do SP40 stain to prove that we are dealing with BK, we are not T-cell mediated rejection. The other thing is, if you find vascular rejection, then surely, even if SP40 stain is positive, that means there is a BKV, but if I find vascular rejection, I will say that there is BKV nephropathy, but along with that, there is a vascular rejection also. So BKV nephropathy will never produce a vascular rejection. It will not produce endothelitis. But BKV nephropathy can produce, uh, uh, can produce, uh, can can give rise to interstitial infiltrate, can give rise to tubulitis. So BKV nephropathy mimics the tubular interstitial rejection, but BKV nephropathy will never produce vascular rejection. The other thing is, there are some papers which say that if you go away from the tubules, which are showing BKV viral inclusions and tubules which are away from uh, these viral inclusions, if you find tubulitis, that suggests coexistent rejection. But I feel that is not a correct thing. I feel if there is tubulitis, even that, even if that tubulitis is away from areas with BKV inclusions, I will still consider that as BKV nephropathy only. And I will not raise a possibility of a coexistent rejection. Even if tubulitis is moderate, I commonly you don't get to see severe tubulitis in BKV nephropathy. You will find moderate mild tubulitis majority of the time. It may extend to moderate tubulitis, but mostly not severe tubulitis. So any more questions, please? Thank you, Dr. Pinoosh. So no more queries. Uh, we can thank, sir, again. OK. Thank you, Puneet. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And so okay. we can share this presentation with the students. Yeah, yeah, you can share. Okay. Uh, it's yeah. all with you. Yeah. Right, Thank right, you. right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night.